Yes, please. <laughs> Welcome. Yes, ma'am. I'm Terry Paula from the Ballard Center at Bowie State University. Welcome. I'm Sheila Brissom with the Christian Social Service on behalf of my team. On this last year, we made the Christian family. Ah! I love that. I love that. Uh, yes, please. Yes. Yes. Well, we'll let her have that. <laughs> Philip. And congratulations on your new role. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm Jeanette O'Neill Gonzalez, and I um, work for the Nationwide Solutions Network. Sure. Okay, thank you. I'm the Social Association Director of Behavior Health with Prince George's County. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Awesome. Welcome, all of you. Uh, my name is Stacy Little, and I am the co chair of this uh, coalition. And I um, will be just, you know, here to help kind of move things along. And uh, just to kind of give you a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to have um, Caitlin is going to be sharing what's going on with the pathways to health equity. So we're super excited about that. So it's either Caitlin or someone else. She's coming. She's coming. Okay, so Caitlin will be here. And then we also have the pleasure of hearing about the um, the community engagement strategies from, from a couple of our hospitals, which I think is really critical as community that we understand how that works in collaboration with the health department and our public health strategies as a county. And then lastly, we'll, we will do um, some work group updates. Okay, so without further ado, do you want to start with? So um, I think I had, uh, Olo is going to give a couple of updates. Okay. And, um, and hi, everyone. I'm Kim Stinchcomb. I'm the manager of the Healthcare Action Coalition. Oh, and if you both want to introduce yourselves too. Oh, please. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm remiss in turning this way. <laughs> Amber Allen, a prevention link program evaluator on the Office of Assessment and Planning Team. Um, first, Amber Allen. Yeah. <laughs> hey, can everybody hear me? Yes. Or do I need to really talk loud? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not good really work. Uh, I, I'm Olo. I'm uh, the deputy health officer at the health department. Uh, I am also uh, sort of standing in for uh, Dr. Sami Ariola, who is our acting health officer slash uh, deputy chief administrative officer for health and human services and education. He regrettably was not able to attend today. Thank you so much, Olo. It seems like these days so many of us have titles with many slashes. Is that not the truth? Okay, so Olo, why don't you come on up? Or are you gonna do it from there? Or how do you wanna do it, Kim? However he feels comfortable. Do you feel comfortable just coming up? Okay, yeah, yeah. perfect, okay. And good evening, everybody. Uh, I really wish I could steal this room for the health department. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a nice space. Uh, but I wanted to uh, talk to you today about uh, two topics. The first is 
our health officer search at the health department. So uh, as many of you might know, the health department has been without a permanent health officer uh, since the end of the last calendar year. Uh, we have been working for uh, quite a while to, in our search for a new health officer, and we are almost there. Uh, we we have found we have actually found somebody. Uh, uh, the uh, official announcement for the new health officer is going to come out from the county executive within the next week. Um, I just didn't want to jump in front of the the county executive and spoil her surprise. So you might you're going to have to wait for a little bit of a week to hear from that. But we're very excited. Uh, about having a permanent health officer to push forward uh, the initiatives uh, that uh, we know are so important to this county. Uh, so we, I believe the new health officer is going to be starting uh, in around mid-August. So you'll have the opportunity uh, after then to uh, meet that person and greet that person and uh, bring that person up to speed on everything that we're doing here. I know I'll be doing my part on that as well. <clears throat> So uh, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is just back to school immunizations and, and partner engagement. So <clears throat> I guess it's really more of a plea for help. <laughs> so we know that we have a big job to do with respect to uh, immunizing kids uh, prior to school enrollment uh, in the fall and school started in the fall. So this has always been something that the health department has uh, worked on every year. Every summer we've done this. Um, we have a, a fairly small staff uh, that we at the health department that of nurses who are working. To, but this is something that um, the health department can't do alone. We partner with the school systems for this, and we are just openly asking for partners to help with this effort. Uh, it's a big job. We know we have an uh, influx of new students coming in from internationally. Uh, so we, we know that we're gonna have a big job ahead of us. So this is kind of a plea for uh, assistance to come work with us. One of the things that we're trying to push at the health department right now uh, is health, uh, public health 3.0. Uh, in, in, in public health 2.0, that was characterized with the health department getting involved in a lot of direct services, uh, doing a lot of stuff ourselves, immunizing folks ourselves and organizing a lot. One of the things that we learned um, over the past few years, and I think what became crystallized within uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is the health departments can't do the work of public health alone. We have to partner with folks. I remember I, I, I was once, uh, I was actually working with Kim to like model what would we need to do to get all the shots into people's arms based upon our capacity. We maxed out our capacity of immunizations and we saw this curve that was going from here to here. Uh, and it looked really impressive until we looked at the need in the county and the need of the county was all the way up here. No matter how hard we worked at the health department, it was physically not a possibility for us to meet the needs of a county that has a million residents. It just isn't. Uh, we could make the health department five times as big. It would not be enough to meet the demands. So Public Health 3.0 really recognizes this and recognizes that the health, because of this, the health department's purpose really has to change in the future. We can't be the ones who are doing everything. We have to be looking at the population uh, as a whole. We have to take that population health perspective and take ownership of that. And we have to work with our partners in the community to develop a shared agenda that we all agree on to make sure that our actions are commonly reinforcing. And, 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 and that really is gonna take a lot of building those partnerships, you know, working with teams of people throughout uh, the county, looking at data, getting a lot more uh, specific about data and what we want to achieve. Are we actually achieving those goals? Uh, so that's a lot of what we have to do as a health department going forward. So that's kind of the undergirding of what, uh, what we need to do with immunizations. We can't do it in the way we did it in the past. It's not going to work. Uh, we have to do these things in a different way. 
just like here in this room, we've recognized that we can't do things in the same way that we did it before. We have to do it in a different way. We have to work with you as partners. We have to engage you. We have to look at the data and see are we moving forward and what can we do together as a team? So I, I think this is reflective of where I think we wanna go in Public Health 3.0. Uh, so hopefully I've uh, done uh, Dr. Ariola justice in talking about this, uh, but I, just to give you a sense of, it's not only about immunizations, but this is about how public health needs to work in the future to be able to meet the needs of the, the public. So thank you everybody. Our next presenter is running a little late. <laughs> so she, Miss Caitlin Murphy will be here any minute walking through the door, but I think in the interest of keeping things moving, um, do you mind if we go ahead and uh, let me switch us over to the right slide and we'll start off with our MedStar Southern Maryland team. And so for everyone, I'd like to welcome Dr. Charmaine Scarlett and Lori Werrell from uh, MedStar Southern Maryland. And let me, I'm going to pull up your sides um, separately because there was a little bit of a formatting. Okay. No problem. Oh. <laughs> we'll give her time. <laughs> Better catch her breath. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Here we are. Um, if you would like me to, that's okay. Know, we can be a walker. Right. Yeah, we'll okay. be all right. I am a walker and talker, but we'll be all right. Thank you. As soon as I figure out how to use the mouse. Video, we have to like, I can transition and I'll take it over. Okay, okay. So, again, we just wanted to come tonight and tell you a little bit about what we're doing um, at MedStar Southern Maryland Hospital Center, both as part of our um, partnership with TLCMD, which is the multi hospital collaborative in Prince George's County, which is all of the hospitals <coughs> working together on projects. plus what Charmaine and her team are doing in terms of um, our direct community health work. So. I can start here if you want. Okay, I was gonna say, <laughs> they're not in the order we thought they were in. Okay, I go know. ahead. <laughs> so based off of the community health needs assessment, there was a lot of need in regard to access to care and social determinants of health. Um, later on in the presentation, I will review some of the efforts that MedStar Southern has embarked on to really meet the needs of the community. Um, we have seen um, high disparities within type 2 diabetes as it relates to food insecurity, as well as overutilization of the ED. So I'm going to review some of the ways that we've combated um, some of those disparities in healthcare. Um, and before um, I transition over to Lori, I do want to highlight that we recognize that there are a lot of social factors that impact one's ability to access health care. Um, the needs of our team, we try our best to meet social determinant health needs for our community members. This includes um, basic features um, as recognizing intersectional identities, as well as meeting um, the needs of homelessness population, food insecurity, and economic features as well. All right, so um, we are part of two of, of the um, Health Services Cost Review Council Catalyst Grants. Um, so TLCMD, which is the multi-hospital collaborative for Prince George's County and St. Mary's County, applied for Catalyst Grants in the last uh, round and actually we are the only region that was awarded in both categories um, or the only county that was awarded both counties categories so we have a, a, um, a 23 million dollar grant 
um, to build out what's called the crisis continuum in Prince George's County and several of our county partners are, are in the room tonight. Um, but it is um, funded through grants with Adventist Fort Washington, MedStar Southern Maryland and UM Capital Region. So those three hospitals came together and through um, adjustments to our hospital rates, we are then funneling the money through to TLC to then build out um, a crisis stabilization center, um, increase the number of mobile um, response teams in the county, um, help with what's called um, care, um, care traffic control. So making sure that the calls are all getting routed and that the people are getting the help that they need um, and helping with the uh, promotion of 988, which is the new phone number that we want folks to use when they need crisis services. Um, we also have the ability to um, give citizens a 24 seven, 30 day um, tech enabled care coordination um, program with a company called Mindula. If they have behavioral health concerns um, that have brought them into the hospital system. So again, 988, you guys, I think we'll probably hear a little bit more about that tonight, or if you haven't, that's definitely the number we wanna get out um, and that we want people using when they need um, assistance in behavioral health uh, crisis. And then the other grant that we have is around diabetes. Again, another uh, big county initiative as well as state and federal. So we, uh, we have a catalyst grant um, for diabetes. It's about $7 million over um, the next we're in year two right now. Um, and so we have very high goals to get as many people as possible into the National Diabetes Prevention Program, which some of you I know provide, as well as the um, DSMES program, which is the, the year long intervention for folks with diabetes. Um, we are um, helping our DPPs and our, our partners um, in the Catalyst Grant, as well as the Prevention Link Grant, with something called an Umbrella Hub, which is the help with billing. Uh, the, uh, CDC is, is very big on sustainability, and one way that they feel that these programs can be sustainable is by making them a billable service. So um, Medicare, um, a lot of the Medicaid products, and, and now some of the commercial insurers are starting to reimburse for the DPP program. And then just making sure that we are expanding DPP and DSMES services throughout the region through partnership. We're, we're going to be starting DPP and DSMES at, at Venice Fort Washington, which didn't have either program before. So really excited about that. So that's kind of our regional, kind of the, what the hospitals together are up to. And then back to our friends at Southern. All right. Now we will review some of the program highlights from MedStar Southern. So I first want to highlight our partnerships with um, Prince George's County Public Schools. We have a EIND committee, Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity Committee, um, and we have a subcommittee in community involvement. And we're doing our best to really understand the needs and exposure to students that they need in order to understand pipelines and healthcare. So thus far, we've participated in a few career days in order to expose students and scholars to different opportunities in healthcare. Um, if anyone is interested, I will also have my cards and we're, all, we're always interested in partnering and exposing students. So I will hang around after just to share that information. And then lastly, let me highlight, we also had a few Ask the Doc series. Um, a few of our community partners that we work with, they have highlighted the need for health education within the community. Um, we have connected our community partners to ob um, dietitians in order to expand health education and health literacy within our community. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. All right. And in addition to that, you may see us in the community over the summer. We're doing our best to um, meet the community needs, show up and let um, our community members know that we are present and a part of the community, not only from the hospital perspective, but as community members. So if you see us at any community events, please stop by our table, say hello. Um, we are more than welcome to meet um, and also attend any community events um, to provide blood pressure screenings as well as health education. Um, these are some of the events we have coming up. I think the last one that we have is um, a health fair coming up on June 17th, as well as a back to school fair at Clinton Baptist Church. Some of my favorite highlights are meeting the needs of um, 
patients that are screen positive for food insecurity. We recently started a food pantry and we are so excited <laughs> that we are able to meet the needs of community members. Um, this food pantry was started in collaboration with our community partners. So DMV Food Justice and Everlasting Joy Foundation, they have been more than generous in providing not only non-perishable items, but healthy, um, that healthy fruits and vegetables to really meet the needs of our community members. So thus far, we've provided 43 food boxes to patients that screen positive for food insecurity. Um, and we first started in January. So we hope to continue to scale up um, as we um, continue to grow our efforts. In addition, we do donate any extra fruits and vegetables that we have on a weekly basis. So thus far, we've donated over 500 pounds of carrots, onions, watermelons, potatoes, oranges, and cabbages to local churches or faith-based congregations. And then this is to give you all more information regarding the demographics and how we're meeting the need of health education. We just started a partnership with the Arc of Knowledge and we do provide Ask the Doctor series for them, um, which I previously discussed. So those are some of our upcoming events. Um, these are open to the public. I'm able to share the Zoom links with you all, but they're also attached in this slideshow if the presentation is shared afterwards. The next thing I wanna highlight is our social needs um, community facing web resource. We do have this on this information on our table at the community events that we do attend, but this gives community members access to look for um, community organizations that meet social determinants of health needs. So you can enter your zip code or the zip code of someone who needs needs in regards to food insecurity, um, housing insecurity, as well as I think food insecurity, housing, and healthcare resources. And this really helps you find um, resources that meet social determinants of health needs based on where the patient or the client is located. Um, this is open to the public. Um, and with this resource, hopefully it comes up, um, it gives you some background information on local organizations that can help to meet this need. Um, you're rewarded with the information immediately, and you can also share it to that person's email or your email in order to explore the site further. Um, I've also linked the tool here if we do share the slides, as I said, and if you have any um, community events or speaking engagements that you would like for us to share this information with the public, um, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Is it a database? Is it is it uh Aunt Bertha? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's all. Yes, they agree, they finally created out Aunt Bertha wasn't the greatest name for it. So at least we're calling it five. Five. Yes. Yeah, I love that. So you utilize the system you said. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have a question about that, actually. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, are you connected with the Food Equity Council for the program? No. Yeah. So they are coordinated through DSS. Um, I think it could be a really good connection because they also do mapping and they they actually get a lot of information when people have excess food that they can't find a home for. So they'll like send it out in a listserv and people get an opportunity to pick it up if they have a need or distribute things if they don't have a need. So that's okay. less going to waste. Great. So I can definitely connect with you. Oh, yeah, I appreciate that. that. One of the things Charmaine didn't mention is through our EI and D work though at the hospital, we've also identified that we have associates that are food insecure. Um, and so we're figuring out ways to make food available to our associates in a confidential and respectful manner as well. Mm -hmm. But that's something that you know our council took seriously and several of our hospitals have started uh, pantries for the associates as well. Are there questions in the chat? Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right, and I would like to now welcome Dr. Zan Smith.
the Director of Service Line and Program Development from Adventist Healthcare. Great job. I'm fairly new to my role. I've been in my role for about a year, but um, this particular um, um, uh, portion of my role just kind of latched on to me the beginning of this year. So I've learned a lot just listening to the two of you. You have a great program, and I hope that maybe we can exchange numbers. <laughs> um, but do I just hear? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Zan Smith. I work at Adventist um, Healthcare, Fort Washington. I've been with Adventist for about 10 years, I'm sorry, and in my current role for just over a year. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you about some of the initiatives, how we kind of pulled our team together um, to kind of make this journey that our partners their MedStar um, are definitely doing a great job. So we're hoping to follow suit. Um, so here you'll see, based on the um, outlined requirements here, which I'm assuming everyone is pretty much familiar with the requirements. I would assume this is my first meeting. Okay. Uh, we did, so for anyone that it might be their first meeting as well, but we completed our community health assessment in 2022 in collaboration with the hospitals and do them every three years. Okay, and based off of the information there, we just we um, formalized um, a plan that I'm gonna go through in a little more detail here. And so this just shows basically, we've got two entities in Montgomery County and um, Fort Washington Adventist Healthcare is in PG County, so. That's where you can find our needs assessment. So based on, um, based on the findings, my primary focus is just to kind of talk to you about our implementation strategy process. Um, we started off January through March. We had a total of six working sessions. We pulled our work group together. Um, it was composed of key stakeholders who um, can help drive some of the initiatives, help develop and identify some of the initiative. This, some of this, these things were occurring prior to me, but um, we haven't, hadn't really been able to stabilize them. So it was kind of nice to pull our team together um, with a specific fo focus on Fort Washington's um, uh, priority areas. And then here again, I'm, this, these are the priorities from 2022, and I will bypass that. Um, we decided we have five. Um, we've identified five areas that we were that were tailored um, to in, in to our internal group. So we were looking at uh, uh, access to care, food access, uh, infectious disease, behavioral health obesity and metabolic sy uh, syndrome. So I'll go into each one of these in greater detail. So looking here, you'll see our plan when we um, brought the team together in January, from January to March, this is was our focus and how we were gonna move forward with developing those initiatives and moving forward. We, as, as it relates to access to care, we wanted to identify what we currently have and identify our partners and did a little brainstorming. You'll see there access to care. We have a fairly new primary care clinic. It's been up for about a, just over a year. And then we are focusing on obesity and um, related care um, uh, prevention for obesity. Medication assistance programs, um, we're partnering, I'm not sure if you all are aware of Adventist Medical Group. It's a group of our uh, physicians who are aligned with the hospital um, to assist with moving forward. We also partner with Allentown Pharmacy, um, Food Access. We have Feed the Fridge, Oxen Hill. This was prior to me. So the next two, uh, Food Access and Infectious Disease, we've been you know, doing those um, consistently um, for prior to my coming, so over a year. Um, infectious disease, we've got HIV, Hep C screening program. That's, uh, uh, we're partnering with the Gilead. Um, we've got a Gilead grant, I think I'm saying that correctly. Prince George's County Health Department, um, Infectious Disease Care Center, and then Heart to Hand. And 
not only am I fairly new to my role, but the key stakeholders that we have are fairly new as well. So we had to do a lot of brainstorming and identify where where we currently are to be able to move forward. <laughs> and then you've got behavioral health. Um, we've got reverse the cycle. That's a mo with um, mosaic, the mosaic grant, and then obesity and metabolic syndrome. Uh, bariatric, as it relates to that, we have a new bariatric service line that just went up just less than a year ago. Um, and then uh, Fort Washington Forward Farmers Market. If you see me on LinkedIn and I wanna connect with anybody who's willing to connect with me, we do a lot of community work with Fort Washington um, Forward Farmers Market. We just had an event actually this past weekend um, at one of the local middle schools. Uh, we partner with, again, Adventist Medical Group. We have our physicians out, out there as, as well um, sometimes. And then, as I stated, Fort Washington Forward. Um, Diabetes Primary Care Clinic. This is exciting for me because in my new role, I am responsible for building programs. And um, uh, one of the newest programs that I'll be uh, putting to, into place is our di Diabetic Primary Care Clinic which will be housed at the, the National Harbor. I'm not sure if any of, many of you know that um, Adventist Healthcare uh, has a joint venture at the Harbor. And so we'll be putting together a diabetic primary care clinic to, uh, to get, the, to, to get um, a larger focus on those diabetic patients um, in our community. Then we also, as it relates to access to care, medication assistance program, providing medication assistance for low income patients with chronic illnesses um, to improve medication compliance and overall health. That's our goal there. And then also with food access, I briefly mentioned Feed the uh, Fridge, Oxen Hill. The goal um, is to increase access to fresh meals in the Glass Manor, Oxen Hill neighborhood for supporting locally owned restaurants. So that has been something that's been in place for um, prior to my arrival as well. So that's something that we're really proud of. And then you, we have um, our infectious disease, the priority area there, HIV, Hep C screening program. Uh, our goal is to improve the care of individuals living with HIV and hepatitis C virus by providing a private and safe, effective um, means of testing. So this is um, well into play. We do a lot of coordinating uh, this specific priority in our ED. Um, let's see. And then for behavioral health, reverse the cycle. The goal there is to decrease um, drug and alcohol abuse in the community by screening, once again, in our ED, every patient um, and making connections to treatment as appropriate. Let's see, the priority obesity and metabolic syndrome. We've got a couple of programs here. Um, once again, the, the bariatric service line, um, we are up and running as of the latter part of last year, and we've been able to perform non-surgical, surgical and non-surgical weight loss, provide surgical and non-surgical weight loss options. That has been um, a good addition to our um, hospital. It's not one that's gonna bring in a lot of funds and it's not a money maker. It's truly something that we're hoping to provide to the community um, to ensure uh, proper diets um, and better health overall. We've got, as I mentioned, the community outreach. We are heavily involved with, with our farmers markets. Um, we also partner with uh, local churches to um, conduct health fairs and things of that nature. This is still growing, it's fluid. We're really trying to um, get this to the, a place where it's gonna be more effective for our um, community. Next steps, we've presented this to the President's Council at Fort Washington um, and it was approved. And this is just our uh, the process that we're looking at um, moving forward. And if there's um, any inf additional information or if you'd like to connect with me, I'd be more than happy um, to partner with any, any of you all. And um, you mentioned some volunteers for immunization. I think I could 
help with that. I would love to help. I'm yeah. starting to ramp up my um, participation in um, nursing associations and they do a lot of community work. So I will be following up. Extending, <laughs> extending that to you, I would love to partner. Right. Yes, thank you. Did anyone have any questions? Uh, I did. So as, as far as you know, uh, what type of key performance indicators are you tracking? And you know how, how are you kind of monitoring yes. your uh, implementation and success? So we, with each of those um, priority areas, we have developed key performance areas, measures of success for those. So we'll be looking at the number of patients that we get, the screenings. Mm -hmm. There's a, I, I'm happy to share that. I can share that with you all at some point. We've got to clearly define the measures of success for each one of them. Yeah, I, I would love to, to hear that, to just kind of see, you know, where Absolutely. your progress is at, where, which areas that, Absolutely. you know, are still that need to get on. So. Not a problem. We especially appreciate having our hospital partners in um, when we get to the work group updates and strategic planning discussion. Um, we're also in our work groups are in the state of strategic planning. So it's especially important to understand what all your partners are doing. So um, we can identify opportunities to either collaborate or um, that make sure that there's just not overlap. We're not doing duplicative effort. And now I would like to introduce Ms. Caitlin Murphy, the Chief of Public Health Innovation and Policy with the Health Department. Okay, thanks. All right, hello everyone. Good to see you all. And sorry to Kim for blowing up her agenda. Thank you for your flexibility. <laughs> um, if I don't show up to my meetings tomorrow, it's because she murdered me. <laughs> but no, I'm just kidding. But um, I am here today to talk to you all about our Pathways to Health Equity grant, um, which is about a year in. So we received a two-year grant from the CHRC, the Maryland Community Health Resources Commission. And um, that grant goes until May, 2024. It's very exciting work because not only is it getting us um, out in the community to do um, more of the type of work that we did in the health enterprise zone, if anyone was around in those days, Lori, I'm looking at you. Um, but it also lays the groundwork for um, the longer term investment in the state of Maryland, which is called the Health Equity Resource Community. And that will be done through the legislative branch and is going to be a large amount of funding that's consistently allocated. So this is the demonstration grant to just prove the quality over cost um, savings that is possible through the type of work that we're doing here. Um, and there were several different awardees, I think in um, Prince George's County, the other awardees were um, Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland doing sickle cell and also La Clinica. And so we're very excited um, to have established four conveniently located telehealth hubs within Prince George's County. And the aim of these hubs is to offer virtual and in-person care coordination services within the target zip code area. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. So really through our Pathways to Health Equity project, we are increasing access to care by establishing these telehealth hubs. And to give a little overview of what that actually means, essentially we have set up in different community-based locations um, with our community partners, and we have a full-time community health worker present in person. Um, and then we have community members come in, they um, receive intake services from the community health worker. And then there's a computer uh, telehealth setup. Eventually we would also like to have peripherals on it to do blood pressure screen, that kind of stuff. And the community health worker can help that patient schedule and actually access a telehealth appointment at one of our federally qualified health centers. So it's a really great way to increase access to care. We saw during the pandemic that folks like telehealth, but sometimes there's a little bit of a um, 
uh, technology gap or the technology at home isn't reliable or something like that. So we have community health workers able to kind of bridge that gap as well as provide connections to things like, you know, sitting down with the patient and helping them fill out a application for SNAP benefits or, um, you know, all those things that now happen online that we can really um, help with by having that in-person integration. And of course, we'll be coordinating referrals. We'll be doing all of the standard community health worker things um, and working with our FQHCs um, to integrate community health workers, you know, to have that bi-directional referral capacity with our FQHCs. And then we'll also be doing some engagement of residents. So definitely getting out into the public and pulling, trying to pull them into the um, telehealth hubs. And that's where we could use your help. So I wanted to make sure we're sharing this information with you all today. Um, our targeted zip codes for this grant are Bladensburg, Riverdale, Capitol Heights, which was our previous health enterprise zone, and Hyattsville, the 20785 Hyattsville. Um, and this is home to about 81,765 individuals, and we know that there's um, a immense need in this area. So we have fully launched all of our sites and I, I don't think I see Dr. Milwaukee, but definitely wanna shout out all of our different community partners um, who have been so instrumental in um, allowing us to have the space to conduct these um, telehealth visits. So we have um, at AWPLI Access to Holistic and Productive, Productive Living Institute, the Langley Park Multi-Service Center, um, Community Outreach and Development Corporation and Greater Beulah Baptist Church. And we are operational Monday through Friday at all of those sites from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we are really in need of some referrals and some assistance spreading the word about these sites. So we have this resource available. There are slightly, oh, I see Ralph. Hey, Ralph. So yeah, Ralph is with AWPLI. I'm sorry. You were like incognito. Yeah, was not intentionally ignoring you. Um, so shout out to AWPLI, one of our great partners. Um, and so we also have a phone line. So I know um, sometimes people like to just confirm that it is the health department or something like that prior to stopping by. So we have a phone number they can call if they need community health worker services. And we also have a website that has a lot of different good information and an email address that they can contact if they are in need of services. So um, definitely send some referrals our way. I'd love to connect with everyone after the meeting. If you have any questions um, now, I'm also happy to answer any of those that you may have. Yes. Yes. So that is launching now. So we're, we sort of, we did like a soft launch situation. You know how it is with the government takes a long time to get the agreements in place and everything. So we did a soft launch and, um, feel good about our workflows and got the community um, health workers comfortable with the technology integrated with our FQHC partners, all of that. Um, and now we're doing the big marketing push. So luckily we have another grant, the, um, a big grant from CDC where we just, I don't know if anyone has heard on the radio, the community health worker, um, commercials are seen on TV. They feature our community health workers, which is super exciting. Um, actually having television commercials. And at the end of those, there is a call to action, which has the, um, phone number for the, tel for the, um, main CHW line as well as the telehealth hub locations. And then my second question is, do they screen out for your... No, so we'll serve anybody. And you'll notice that actually some of those, um, two of those sites are not directly within the zip codes of service just because there's so much overlap over those areas. And we wanted to make sure we were locating in high traffic areas. The point of them is to be convenient. So we didn't want to, you know, open in sites where driving traffic would be like the main uh, would be a huge uh, obstacle, I guess. Um, so we're, we're definitely excited to launch our marketing campaign. However, I will also say all of us who do work in the community know that marketing is nice, but what gets people out is hearing from their friends and family that they, you know, had a successful experience at a place or, so we're also focusing a lot on our on the ground outreach efforts and trying to really 
um, both invest in smaller organizations to get to help bring people to the hubs, but also to do some like marketing, more local marketing in the area to spread the word. And I think with any project, it's kind of like a trickle at first, and then it comes in a little stronger. So we're hoping that, you know, this next month or two, we're going to see a really big increase. I think um, we've only seen a, a like 50 patients so far. So we're kind of, we're hoping to get our numbers up pretty soon. Yeah, trickle. And my last question is, uh, who are your medical partners or your partners there to Yes. So. Yes. So as of right now, our confirmed clinical partner is CCI Health and Wellness, which is, of course, one of our FQHCs. We're in talks with other FQHCs and we're hopeful to kind of get things official pretty soon. And then, um, I mean, we would love to partner also with hospitals and your ambulatory systems if that's something that you're interested in. Um, yeah, we were a little concerned, not concerned, but just anticipated um, there being some challenges related to reimbursement and everything, but every FQHC we've talked to has been super interested in this and has reported that their, um, their patients do struggle a lot with getting on the telehealth sometimes. And a lot of people want to be in person with someone. And so it's been helpful, but, you know, don't necessarily want to be, have to travel very far or anything. And so it's convenient in that way. Sure. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Moving right ahead, um, we're going to step into some work plan wow. and strategic planning updates. So as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, we are um, in the kind of peak of strategic planning within each of the work groups, uh, HEAL, Behavioral Health Work Group, and Health Equity. Uh, so what that means is we're taking all the feedback from our community health assessment, and we're working with the work groups to define what are our goals going to be, what are our strategies going to be for the next three years, and we'll be putting all that information into our community health improvement plan. So for our healthy eating, active living, we still have our three subcommittees are active. Uh, healthy food priority areas is currently working on mapping the food facility data, uh, working with food insecurity data, and exploring what additional GIS layers they can add to their map. Uh, such as distance from public transport or anything else that they um, explore. I know um, Patrick Callahan is taking the lead on this effort and um, he's working very closely with DSS who also has a lot of map overlays uh, that just define different accesses to food. And then we have food as medicine who I know we have Turin Shaw in the uh, She's joining us remotely. She's one of our leads for the Food as Medicine group. So Tarim, feel free to add anything that I miss. But uh, they're currently working on pilot program evaluation for the Food as Medicine program for Prince George's Fresh. And they've submitted an application um, with IPHI has submitted an application to continue this work for CDC REACH. And then they will plan to relaunch the program after implementing all of the changes that they find uh, would be useful through the evaluation process. And then thirdly, our integrated health work group, they are working on redefining uh, what integrated health means to the group and very much focused on the strategic planning around that definition. I'd like to invite Dr. Slade Martin to come up and talk a little bit about the health equity work group. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's great to see everyone in person. Uh, first, I, I have the uh, pleasure, and she sends a shout out uh, over the over Zoom. Uh, Zexaser uh, Coyote uh, is our new co-chair. So let's give her a round of applause. 
I'm so happy uh, that we uh, have this uh, co-chair and she has uh, jumped in and is doing a fantastic job. Uh, you might have heard us also talk about the Health Equity Champions uh, Program. Uh, and that's really an advocacy and education program. We have worked the full year and then some on really developing a uh, curricula that will uh, we will be able to spread out through the county and work with different community groups and individuals uh, in the county within agencies and other organizations. Um, to really look at high app and health equity uh, issues and really do uh, a lot of work in training and educating community members. Uh, and it would be led by, and, and um, the training would be led by and participated uh, with uh, community members. Uh, so we are excited that we've been doing a collaboration with the University of Maryland uh, and the students of the uh, Terrapin Think Tank. We worked hard this year to uh, develop our first draft of the curriculum. So give us a round of applause. No. <laughs> so we, we did put a lot of uh, energy uh, into that. And what's wonderful is the uh, students at the Maryland um, Terrapin Think Tank are really working and they have worked hard uh, all semester. Uh, to refine and develop the curriculum. And so uh, we are looking forward to a, a report from them on this Thursday and this Thursday's meeting. Uh, and then we're going to have the honor of passing the torch and the work uh, over uh, to um, uh, a department. I, I won't uh, make the official announcement yet but we will pass the torch so the work can begin and be actually implemented. Uh, and then we are working uh, uh, very diligently uh, on the goals and updating our goals and our strategic planning uh, and we'll uh, continue that work on Thursday. So uh, hopefully you all can join us uh, on, at 3.30 on Thursday for our uh, monthly meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And then lastly, we have our behavioral health advisory group. Uh, we're definitely in a state of rebuilding with this group. So we're focused on partner engagement with our internal and external partners, rebuilding, and ultimately identification of co-chairs to take the lead for this work group. It's a very important work group. Um, we definitely have been monitoring the data around mental health and behavioral health in the county, and the work is valuable and needed. Uh, so we've also been doing some strategic planning uh, with the active participants in the group, identification of work group goals and strategies. So how can everyone here get, contribute to strategic planning? So you can complete our Prince George's Healthcare Action Coalition strate strategic planning survey. There is a QR code at the bottom of all of your uh, agendas on tonight for tonight. So you can certainly access it there and we'll send a follow-up uh, email with instructions to complete that survey where you can just provide feedback on areas that you think uh, are specifically important. And we'll take that feedback back to all of our work groups so that they can consider it. But the other important way that you can contribute to our strategic planning process is attending the upcoming work group meetings. We'll be working really diligently throughout the summer and hopefully be coming back in September with a final update of our uh, strategic planning timeline and our goals. So I just wanted to give a special shout out to all of the co-chairs for all of the work groups. And here you can see when those work groups meet. Um, we just had a recent HEAL meeting, so they won't be meeting again until August. Um, but health equity again, yes, that meeting is on Thursday. So you can definitely get part of that conversation. And behavioral health will be meeting next Wednesday, the 21st. And I did touch on this a bit, but our next steps are completing this process, finalizing our work plan, action items in the timeline, and then ultimately having a finished product with our community health improvement plan. And we'll continue the monitoring for those goals and activities uh, annually until the next community health assessment is completed. So next, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our community care coordination team. 
So I'm bringing Caitlin back up because she has the <laughs> most information about this, but it's a new effort that we're hoping to bring into the coalition. Yes, hello everyone, I'm back. Um, so does anyone remember the CCCT? Okay, I see, yeah, Christine, okay. Anybody Anybody else? Okay, just Christine and maybe Dr. Little, did you work out? No, okay, so, <laughs> so we got one. Um, oh, I see Sharon's hands up. Yeah, Sharon remembers. So um, the CCCT came out of the Health Enterprise Zone, which was, um, I remind me when that ended, 2017. So basically what we saw is that we have a lot of different um, partners that have some hand in care coordination, but we don't have coordinated care coordination. And so we, you know, I, I remember speaking with one of our um, project officers for a CDC grant who told us that a um, study just came out that the average Medicaid recipient has 27 case managers. Like, how would you know <laughs> who you're speaking with when they call? Um, and so it starts to make sense why people maybe don't answer the phone um, when you're trying to reach them. So. We developed the CCCT, and I say we, I wasn't quite here yet, but I, I joined it when I did join the health department um, five years ago. Um, and it, it was really a way for us to make sure that um, the right partner was able to intervene with the right patient at the right time, providing the right services so that they weren't overwhelmed with care coordinators and they were able to access the care that they needed. And we did that in, in um, HEZ, we did it in a um, both like a individual patient way where we had data sharing agreements and everything, and then a more global way. And once HEZ ended, we, um, we shifted towards really looking at the system of care and how we could reduce redundancies and improve our efficiency and make sure we're a little bit more coordinated. Um, so we had, I mean, this was an awesomely well-attended meeting. It was in person at the health department in our uh, OHO conference room and there was like not enough chairs for the number of people who were there and it was not the kind of meeting where you could come and drink coffee um, it was run by um, Barbara if anyone remembers Barbara and it was like you better put some work down on a piece of paper and turn it in before you go um, but people loved it they really liked um, to be able to talk through those issues and so to give you like one example of something that we worked on we looked at um hospital to home transition and the 30 days post, you know, post um, discharge to see what the readmissions, uh, you know, to look at the readmissions there and, and listed each organization and where they fall. Where is your ideal period where you intervene with the patient to prevent that readmission? And then we shared that information. So then everybody had, okay, if I, you know, if I'm a hospital discharge coordinator, this is who I might want to get in contact with right away. Here's who I might want to refer to longer term and making sure those connections across the different partners were clear also. Something else we are working on is um, looking at our homelessness uh, care continuum because we know that one thing we heard over and over again from care coordinators is there are not enough services for homelessness. And there's a lot of the times it kind of feels like not a whole lot we can do to help. So we look, we had to look across the different organizations, really analyze the need and what resources were available and um, be better coordinated in any ask that we had for what resources we want, just making sure that everyone has that information. So we had good representation. I won't read this to you, but you know, we had all of the health health systems represented, uh, you know, ambulatory systems, FQHCs, everybody was kind of present. So we're really excited because that was put on a brief hiatus um, because of a pandemic. So we were a little busy and did not um, have the time and, uh, you know, energy to dedicate to CCCT. So it was paused for a little bit, um, but it's time to relaunch it. I think across all of our different projects, I see a real need for this. And um, we're going to pull it back together this time within the infrastructure of the Healthcare Action Coalition, which we're excited about. It's um, definitely looking at structural issues. Um, and so we're excited to have that uh, be a work group that's added. Um, and that's all I have for CCCT. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, well, I will see all of you there. <laughs> So, so I have a quick 
but so sure. are there going to be specific, what are you going to be targeting as far as issue areas and metrics? Uh, or is that going to be developed? Yeah, that's going to be developed. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. You did that much better than I would have. <laughs> So now I want to open up to any community updates that anyone wants to share, take the opportunity to share with any of your partners while they're in the room. Um, anyone online, feel free to uh, put it in the chat and, or raise your hand and we can uh, give you the floor as well. And while anyone's thinking about it, I'll share that we do have a new Prince George's Healthcare Action Coalition calendar of events on our website. Uh, so you can actually add your community events right into the website. Thank you so much to Ray Wallace for putting this together. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to not only share our work group meetings, but also allow our partners to share their events as well and get the word out. And I'll give last call for any community updates they want to share. But if not, uh, thank you everyone so much for attending. And our next meeting will be in September, September 12th. We are expecting to have this one remote, but you'll be getting updates along the way. Thank you all. And feel free to, to mingle, have some desserts for those in the room or uh, extra dinner. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>